freaking bat magnet. Uh oh. No, 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 no! Ah! Ah! My blood! He, he punched out all my blood! Okay, hands up. Who expected this game to be unbelievably shit? Nine years of development and three dev studio changes with the current studio being a subsidiary of a subsidiary whose only notable game was the mess that was Homefront Revolution? Yeah, hopes are not high. Hell, I bought this game on the premise that it'll be interesting just to see how bad it ended up being. So, much to my surprise, I actually thought it was pretty good. Well, more specifically, it's fine. But in a great way. Most games from big studios these days are either really good experiences across the board, utter train wrecks of design, jank, and performance, or they just tick every box a AAA game needs in order to appeal to the broadest masses, making a game that by all accounts is good, but it's just played so safe that it's mediocre. That's my overall takeaway from this game. It was engaging enough to keep me going for almost 30-something hours, but there are still a lot of criticisms you could levy against this game, like a lot. So, Dead Island 2 continues the lineage of first-person zombie em ups that was carried on by Dying Light and the weird sequel spin-off Dead Island Riptide. That is to say, this is a pseudo-open world with a focus on looting, crafting, and utilizing your environment to your advantage in many encounters. The game starts out by setting the tone you can expect. Everyone is fleeing for their lives as a zombie outbreak occurs, but with some exaggerated moments where we find out the sprinkler systems have been jury-rigged to become flamethrowers that automatically torch everyone on the vehicle when a zombie is detected, since no one is getting out of that uninfected. The game really likes to go back and forth between serious and silly with a huge tonal dissonance that is pretty jarring but overall entertaining. It doesn't go too wacky as to make everything feel super cheesy, and when it tries to get serious it actually manages to nail it fairly well thanks to some great acting. Once the intro is over, you're presented with a number of characters to pick from. Unlike previous Dead Island games, your character choice doesn't really make as much of an impact on how you play. They have a variety of different stats, but they largely just feel the same. I first played with Amy, the fastest and most frail character, but upon replaying some of the game as Ryan, the slowest and possibly even the tankiest character, he felt almost no different. Yes, these examples are both from the literal start of the game, but I'll get into why that doesn't matter towards the end. There are two major differences between characters. First, they have two innate bonuses that usually consist of an offensive and defensive effect. Amy restores stamina when hitting enemies with a weapon throw and can do more damage to isolated enemies, while on the other hand, Ryan gets a stagger bonus when blocking or dodging and can regain health from knocking enemies over. The other major difference is what passives you unlock. Nearly every single one is shared between characters with the exception of a grand total of eight. However, they aren't unique to just one character. They are shared between two characters each. For example, any passive exclusive to Amy also lumps in Bruno, and yes, there's eight passives spread across three groups of six characters. So Amy and Bruno straight up get shafted with one less passive to use. Uh, unless I missed one in all the lists I looked at. In general, I felt like picking Amy was a mistake due to how little the character contributed to what I did in this game, and not from a lack of trying. There is a third change, and this one I can't really quantify very well without playing the whole game over several times. What abilities you start out with and unlock as you level do differ between characters. In the end, you will have the same passives as everyone else, regardless of what order you got them in. Easiest example is that some characters start with a block instead of a dodge, and they unlock the drop kick instead of the flying kick first. So now for the moveset you have available. Melee-wise, you have a light attack, heavy attack, and weapon throws. To aid in melee combat, you have a thrown equipment that run off cooldowns, and it can range from creating hazards to just pure damage dealers. When it comes to abilities, you can pick whether you want your primary defensive tool against enemies to be a dodge or a block. A well-timed use of either leaves an enemy stunned and open them up for a counter. Both have their uses, but overall I found block to be far more effective. You don't take any chip damage whether it's a perfect block or a normal block, so if you miss a perfect block, you just absorb the hit. And the window for a counter feels way larger than with the dodge, especially when a failed dodge probably means you also ate that hit. 
But there's also a few combat abilities. You can kick while you're in the air to do either a flying kick that deals damage, or a drop kick that knocks enemies over and deals greater stagger power in exchange for dealing less damage. This makes it great for throwing enemies into hazards or breaking their stability so that they enter a vulnerable state and can be executed. Then you unlock a special action button with a few unique abilities. AoE debuffs, slams, dash attack. Each one has its own major use and generally are all effective based on what your setup is trying to achieve. Later on, you unlock a special rage mode where you gain greatly enhanced melee power and one extra special attack unique to this mode. All of this is handled with the card system, in which you have a set amount of slots for each type that allow you to freely slot in passives. This includes your abilities. It's pretty good that you can switch things in and out on a dime, and that there are a lot of options you can mess with, but at the same time, I feel like the execution is a bit lacking compared to the more focused skill trees of prior games. In prior games, you played into your character with specific bonuses that felt at least somewhat impactful, even if a lot of them were just damage and handling bonuses. You at least had some unique mechanics to spice things up. The cards in this game are all super broad conditional modifiers. Did you dropkick someone? Here's some crit damage. Did you dodge an attack? Here's a small attack speed boost. Did you maim someone? Here's some health. The passives never end up dictating what you can do. It's only ever there to help whatever items you're currently rocking. And going back to the first dead island, you did have passives like a percent chance to have your thrown weapons teleported back to you when it was thrown. And this would be the backbone of a thrown weapon setup no matter what your currently held weapons do. Nothing like that really exists in this game. Instead, the only bonus for throwing any weapon is a generic global damage buff that you get when you hit an enemy with a thrown weapon. That's it. And yeah, I'm still kind of pissed that using throwing weapons as an actual playstyle does not exist because of how few bonuses there are. I ended up never really throwing my weapons because the damage was never worth it, and there's no other incentive to throwing something other than triggering hazards. Are the bonuses at least impactful? Overall, no? At least the damage ones. They are pretty small bonuses, and it never felt like the base time to kill for enemies was that long in the first place. The cards that help apply status effects, give health, and other effects had a much greater impact. So what does dictate how you play? It's a mix of what abilities you want to use, whether you want to lean into knocking zombies all over the place by lowering their stagger meter, or if you want to abuse the special modifiers your weapons have. Usually one of the innate modifiers all weapons have. So to explain how loot works in this game, it really doesn't. This loot system barely functions like any looter shooter around today, if it's even trying to go for that. Every weapon you find will function the exact same as another of that same type at base. The only difference is what goes in the modification slots. That's it. Sometimes you'll find a weapon with a pre-installed mod that you don't have, but those are very rare and outside of later game mods, they aren't interesting enough to be worth it. Like the cards, they're either flat stats to a specific thing, or conditional stat boosts, sometimes increasing one stat at the cost of another. The only thing you have to look out for when it comes to what weapons to pick up is their rarity, as this does nothing but dictate the amount of slots they get to use, and also their power level. This is a stat that vaguely increases the amount of damage and possibly knockback your weapon does. However, once you regularly get the highest tier of weapons, which is purple, you can just ignore this stat, and focus purely on what the level of the weapon is. The only thing that truly changes how you approach weapons are the weapon intrinsic properties that are the same for every weapon of that type. It has a broader weapon class trait and a more specific bonus to the weapon itself. These traits are more or less focused solely on what gimmick you need to do in order to force critical hits. That's pretty much the name of the game, what can you do to score critical hits. Some of these include forced critical hits when you strike an enemy in the limbs, and regenerating stamina when you maim them, forced critical hits when you land headshots, and increasing attack speed with every hit, and forced critical hits once you reach max speed. There are a total of four shared between all melee weapons, and four shared between all firearms. Since they allow you to force critical hits, you basically pick whatever weapon fits whatever you're currently doing, so you can at least get a huge increase in damage. The weapon-specific modifiers aren't all super unique, but occasionally very nice. Things like extra stagger power, extra durability, damage reduction while you're holding it. Nothing crazy, but it can be that little extra boost to whatever you're gonna end up doing compared to other weapons. So overall, the loot system is very unimpressive. Even in moments where the game tries to give you uniquely named weapons, because the mod system is the way it is, the weapons are either insanely bland, or you could just make the weapon yourself. Now, it may have a power difference, but chances are it's so narrow it won't matter, and even if it happened to be the highest level thing you have, it also doesn't change much because of one other mechanic. You can just 
Spend money at a workbench to match your weapons to your current level. Since weapons have no difference beyond the pre-installed mods, the first purple you find will be just as good as the last one you'll find before you beat the game because you can just upgrade its power constantly. And as I said, all Rarity does is adding more slots you can use, so once you get a purple, you win the game's progression. You just have to find blueprints to keep upgrading it with new and more powerful mods, and not replacing the weapon itself. Now, it can get costly to level match, but once you get a set of weapons you know you'll rarely change between, you can just sell the rest and only upgrade your weapons when it's more than two levels behind, since you really won't feel much of a loss of power at that point. It also saves you a lot of time picking up new weapons and crafting those same modifiers on them just to get that increase in power. The resource cap is 99, which seems fine at the start, but later upgrades, when built on a mass, can quickly drain that supply. You can quickly get it back up, but you could just not do that, and just keep level matching items while selling everything else. Okay, so the loot system is non-existent, and the builds are relatively mundane. At least fighting the zombies gives you plenty to work with, right? Well, Let's just say with only five enemy types, you shouldn't expect much. At least they aren't unfun to fight, but the game doesn't particularly do much with them. You have your normal zombie types of a shambler, walker, and runner, with each of them getting more and more aggressive and tanky, but basically functioning the same. You have the crushers, which are tanks that can cause a fair bit of chaos by doing an AoE slam attack, which either throws zombies all over the place, or detonates any environmental hazards, which can fuck with you, but that's about it. If anything, it makes it annoying to utilize all the gas cans around them, since they just blow them up immediately. Then you're introduced to screamers, which summon zombies, attract more, and enrages them all, and they'll slow you down greatly by screaming right at you. Thankfully, they don't do damage or stun you with this scream, so you can easily deal with it by throwing something at them. For this style of enemy, it's not a bad way of handling them, since they're not that annoying. Then you have exploders, which are just suicide bombers, vomiters who lob projectiles... There really isn't much in terms of interesting enemies. Beyond the screamers, the only other interesting enemies that have things like mechanics and attack patterns are introduced so late, you barely get to fight them. And they really try and stretch out this limited roster by introducing elemental variants of enemies, which isn't bad, because they at least try to make them unique. Only one of them is a generic, guy who's always on fire type of enemy. They have at least some unique mechanic to them. Flame runners can be extinguished, and have the unique property of dealing damage while they grab you, when you're otherwise immune to damage beyond failing the QTEs. Electrician zombies occasionally pulse lightning, letting you set up elemental hazards for them to trigger, or just push them into zombies since they stun everything around them, including themselves. And for some reason, they decided to make a bleed variant of zombies, which is my favorite because these zombies are just absolutely covered in spikes or barbed wire, and their unique mechanic is that all unarmed special attacks will build up bleed on you. So drop kicking them, using unarmed, using your palm strike, they all deal a little damage and build up bleed. It's weird and dumb, but I kind of love it. Like, it makes you wonder what the fuck this zombie did. Did they just run into a broken glass factory or something and just decided, eh, you know what, I'm good. But what I don't love is how they are immune to their respective element. I mean, it makes sense they have a resistance to it, but this game is a quirk that makes it especially awful. When you put an elemental mod on your weapon, it doesn't just add elemental damage, it converts all of your damage to that type, meaning your 44 Magnum will do zero damage to a zombie covered in glass just because you sharpened your bullets a little. But past all that, the worst part about the enemies is they rarely make tailored encounters, so they almost never do anything interesting like throw two different types of special zombies at you and let you figure it out. It's mostly just one type of special zombie at a time with some runners mixed in. And yes, I realize I just spent the last 15 or so minutes doing nothing but talking about how mediocre the game and its systems are. And it's true, this game is just lacking in a lot of ways, or has a lot of underdeveloped ideas for how much game there is, since I ended up getting closer to 30 hours with still a number of side quests to do. Regardless of this game's history, these are all fair criticisms, even if it's understandable that it turned out the way it did. So what kept me going for nearly 30 hours of this game? This.
despite its faults, this game feels amazing to play. It still has some rough edges, like slower weapons having really floaty animations, but overall the feedback from slashing zombies' arms off, shattering their legs to make them immobile, cracking their elbows and watching them just flap around as they're unable to do anything, it all feels so goddamn good. And that fucking visual feedback as well. Zombies may not flinch too much, but it's really fun to just fist fight a zombie and halfway through you step back and you can see that not only you punched off his clothes, but you can see their still beating heart through the hole in your rib cage you caved in. Like what the fuck? Did the devs just say fuck it and instead of making interesting content for this game, they spent all their time fleshing out the zombie flesh peeling mechanics? It's actually crazy how granular it is and how good it looks. And not only is melee combat great, but the guns also feel surprisingly satisfying. Even better, unlike the first in Island in Dying Light, when you start to get guns, they never begin throwing horribly boring and pace-changing human enemies at you to make the game worse. Instead, guns fill the role of reliable but limited range, since you can only carry so much ammo on you at once and that ammo pool is relatively limited. Essentially, guns last about as long as high-tier weapons do with the exception of assault rifles and SMGs, which can kill unbelievably fast, but blow through ammo just as fast. And for as much as I ragged on the game for having uninteresting passives and limited options that really define your play, you can at least still have plenty of fun with the weapon gimmicks and piecing together builds with what abilities you have and what stacking bonuses you can put together that feel impactful enough. Like I was really enjoying my time with the Brass Knuckles having frenzy, so I just boosted the hell out of my attack speed with mods and cards, so I was just shredding through enemies and weapons like mad. Then I found out how many bonuses to maiming enemies there were, so I used a lot of maiming weapons that would allow me to run around and just one-hit kill enemies by stealing their kneecaps. After that, I was taking maiming to the extreme when I utilized Fury Mode and a card that lets you gain Fury when you maim enemies, which allowed me to use Fury Mode pretty much indefinitely. It built up so fast that sometimes I ended up using Fury Mode as a better sprint because goddamn some of the environments are big and spaced out at times. I eventually found out about a very specific mechanic. In many games, you're only allowed to hold a total amount of any given ammo type between all your reserve and currently loaded ammo. Dead Island 2 treats ammo reloaded as ammo spent, so while the max reserve ammo of shotguns is 30, if you have 8 equipped shotguns and 8 reserve shotguns, that's a grand total of around 126 shotgun shells you can store across all your guns depending on the shotgun. Since most high damage shotguns had demolition, a modifier that made it so enemies you put into a vulnerable state by depleting their stagger meter take forced crits, I would just run at zombies, dropkick them, try to shoot them out of the air before they hit the ground, and then run away. If I'm surrounded, I would then use the ground pound to build up stagger on multiple enemies. Remember kids, Switching to your 7th shotgun is faster than reloading the other 6. That said, reloading 16 shotguns was really annoying, but it was funny enough to be worth it. Overall, trying to piece together some excessive loadout every half hour to try and dab on these zombies harder and harder was what kept me going. Actually interacting with the zombies is fun enough, but the different gimmicks and the sheer level of satisfaction of ramming my entire bare fist through a zombie's face was enough to keep me going. Those finishers might get repetitive since there's only one per weapon, but goddammit if they don't feel good. Anyways, back to all the ways this game is kinda mediocre. The story is just... so uneventful? Until it's suddenly not, and then it makes no sense. It starts like any other zombie game does, but with a little extra flair since this event has happened before. You're repeatedly introduced to characters who have no actual bearing on how the story is progressing beyond suggesting where to go, and even then the main character more or less figures everything out on their own and only occasionally reports back to everyone. No character beyond the main protagonist gets more than three scenes, even if they play a pivotal role in the story. The moment someone might be relevant, they're just forgotten for god knows how long. What takes the cake though is the ending. It just decides to recontextualize the entire series from a simple localized zombie infestation to something that is so much bigger than the characters really need to give a shit about. It's also full of so many dumb twists and plot holes. And the best part is, it's all dropped on you in the last 30 seconds of the game with no build up whatsoever. By the end, you get an idea of what the end goal is and that something might be bigger going on behind the background, but the actual reveal is so much bigger than you could possibly expect that it just comes out of left field. If you don't care about spoilers, skip to this timestamp. I'll try and cover it real quick. Basically, 
The zombie virus isn't a zombie virus. It's actually a hard-coded genetic time bomb, essentially, that once it hits zero, every last human being, save for I guess the people who are immune, who are suddenly super evolved people who can communicate telepathically and have dominion over these zombies, I guess, maybe? Uh, every last person will become a zombie. Like, this is literally extinction event levels of shit that might not even happen in any of these characters multiple lifetimes over. So why the fuck did this even need to be brought up? The best part is, the outbreak in LA was created specifically so they could find people who are immune and study them to figure out a cure for all this shit. And then immediately reveals that he created a cure by modifying their child before they were born. And that the cure actually works. And you only find that out now because I guess they never tested it? Despite them being almost 20 years old probably? Maybe there was some special catalyst they never had to actually make the cure? Oh, and then someone who was immune to the zombie disease caught the zombie disease and they used the one cure they had to cure that person? Because? Once that confusing mess of an ending wraps up, the game actually does something neat. There's more side quests to do post-campaign. Which is nice, since the side quests are one of the better parts of this game. Sure, they might be generic, go here, kill thing, fetch thing, with occasional conditions on how they want things to be killed, but the one-off characters are amusing enough. Some horribly grating though, like the stereotyped social media influencers. And it also reminds me of how dumb the loot system is. You'll notice all you find are purple weapons happy through the game. Well, there are white, green, blue, and purple weapons, so surely there are orange legendaries, right? And you'd be correct! but they're only obtainable from post-game quests. The only difference about them is that they have two fixed mods and two open mod slots. However, unlike every other weapon in the game, they actually have unique mods. One to be exact. The other's a fixed mod that tries to pair well with the first, but it's something you can craft yourself. But granted, they're not incredible. A lot of the weapons just end up playing like all the others, just with more power. So in the end, you're just leaning into the same playstyles. For example, getting critical hits with this weapon that gives you critical hits for limb strikes, in turn, increases limb damage and applies a status, while also having a modifier that spreads status to other enemies. Or, this revolver that adds exploding rounds, which increase stagger damage to an enemy on a weapon that gets crits on enemies who've been staggered. It's not ideal, but at least the game finally gives you something you can say is somewhat unique. Even if it ultimately doesn't matter much for one reason and one reason alone. Everything scales way too well in this game. Without much in the way of skill trees, stat boosts, or randomized stats on weapons, everything basically relies on nothing but your level and your weapon power. At level 1, you will basically take as many hits to be killed and require the same amount of hits to kill an enemy as you would at the very end of the game. There are only two major exceptions to this. The first is two or three small corners of various levels where enemies are just a much higher level than you and when you enter a new area the enemies might be a level or two higher than you at first but once you level up everything will just scale to you exactly you can go back to the very first area in the game and everything will be just as hard as the final area of the game so once you get all purples you never really have to pick up another weapon beyond selling it since you can just level match your gear like i mentioned earlier and speaking of the various areas in this game they're pretty cool Overall, this game looks fucking great, and taking the idea of plausibly realistic LA locations gives you a fair bit to work with, and this game does it mostly well. The environments are detailed and overall well laid out, where the more side quests you do, the more side rooms, shortcuts, and random crafting locations open up to make your life easier. When it comes to exploring, though, it becomes a lot less interesting. At first, you're presented with a number of locked safes and rooms that require either a specific key to open, or a fuse to put into a fuse box. Problem is, you can search all you want, but some of the safes are straight up inaccessible until later in the game, and you can only hold three fuses at once, for some reason, despite shops regularly refilling them. So, you just have to constantly remember, okay, there's a lockbox here, I'll just check on it later. And the reason you can't access them right away is that some keys aren't just found with a little bit of exploring. Many are just dropped from specific enemies. Enemies you might not be able to spawn because that enemy type it's attached to hasn't been discovered yet. In the first area, I found a safe that I spent way too long searching for. I gave up and continued. I returned when I discovered the crushers, and nothing. I returned when I discovered the exploders, nothing. 
Finally, I returned after encountering the Screamers, and... nothing! So, I figured I just missed the key somewhere. Explored for 15 minutes or so, and suddenly a specific named Screamer spawned which dropped the key. That's right, it's also a random fucking chance for you to get the enemy to spawn. So what's the reward? And 99% of the time, it's just some money or a weapon. Suffice to say, it's kind of a pointless reward unless you're looking for a purple version of a weapon you've not been able to find yet. So that's Dead Island 2. Some might wonder why I spent so long talking about a game that, by all accounts, is firmly mediocre. But that's because I personally loved it. And this opinion is coming hot off the back of me finally beating Dying Light for the first time just four days before this game came out. I recognize most of the design decisions feel super rushed and poorly thought out because this game went through three or four different development studios, but by god if the foundation of being a half-serious and half-cheesy-as-fuck zombie-smashing experience isn't incredibly strong. Yes, we've had thousands of other zombie-smashing games over the last few decades, but that doesn't inherently make this game bad.